Greetings in the resurrected one, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's that time of the year, that season where we are celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what a timely message that God has given us centered around the blood of Jesus Christ. We've been teaching on this message for a couple of weeks here, and I know you have been strengthened uh, by hearing and, re and remembering what Christ has done for us through his death, burial, and resurrection. Well, again, as always, thank you for joining me to uh, gather around the table of truth uh, with the heart of faith. We're getting ready to get in the word of God. And I know you have your Bible there or either you have your smartphone with a Bible app and, and you're ready to go through the scriptures to hear what God is speaking to the church. Well, let us go into a time of prayer and then we will go right into our lesson. Father, we honor you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrection in the life. Thank you for the knowledge of his will that you have imparted unto us that we might know you and be known of you. We ask now in the name of your son, Jesus, that you will speak to each one of our hearts, Father. We know that you're doing a good work on the inside of us and you're perfecting those things concerning us. So we ask now in the name of Jesus that you will have free course in our hearts that you might bring to our understanding, bring to our insight, the things that we need to do, adjustments we need to make, Father, are the encouragement we need from your word so that we can continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Well, we're talking from the theme, season the God-given moments. There are moments that God has given opportunity for you and I, the, the believers, and we need to know how to take advantage of those moments. In Ephesians chapter 5, beginning around verse number 15, down through verse 17, and I'm paraphrasing it, Paul basically encouraged the Christians to be wise and not foolish, redeeming the time or buying back the time or seizing the God-given moments so that we will know how to conduct ourselves in the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ because we're living in evil days or evil times. Well, up to this point, the Spirit of God has been taking us on this spiritual journey into the greater insight and edification by focusing our faith on the blood covenant of Jesus Christ. Someone shared with me the other day that I never thought of the blood of Christ in these various ways. Well, that's why God continued to feed us the spiritual manner of the word so that we won't limit ourselves. God is an unlimited God. He can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. So we have a responsibility to continue to uh, get in God's word and continue to grow in the revelation of God's word. Well, the blood of Jesus have given us so many wonderful benefits as children of God. Some of the things that we've already ministered on is that first and in, in, in a, a powerful ingredient of having forgiveness of sin. Yes, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin, according to Hebrews 9 and 22. And we also experience the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. That word sanctification is simply being set apart for God and for his glory. We also understand that through this blood covenant, we have open access uh, with priestly fellowship with our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are able to be free from operating with dead works in order to serve the living God in a manner that is acceptable through the Lord Jesus Christ. We also learned about the authority that we have when it comes to spiritual conflict, when it comes to dealing with matters in the unseen realm through the blood of Jesus, the confession of our faith in a surrendered life to the will of God. And in our last lesson, we talked about how the blood of Jesus strengthens our faith. That in the midst of suffering, of fiery-like experiences, Peter came and encouraged those Christians how they could experience enrichment, encouragement, and an endurance through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the blood of Christ provides strength for our faith. Today, I want to move into another dimension of spiritual insight 
whereby the blood of Jesus, according to scripture, provide wholeness in our spiritual and physical well-being through the vehicle of prayer and God's divine compassion. And turn with me to Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53, the prophet Isaiah proclaims a prophetic word by the Spirit of God concerning the coming Messiah. Now, some even so-called trained theologians, they debate that uh, their argument is that these verses make reference to Israel. But I think if we study those moments leading up to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is without a shadow of doubt that the prophet Isaiah is making reference to the Lord Jesus Christ relative to his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And so in Isaiah 53, and I'm going to begin reading at verse number one, the prophet begins like this. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Verse 5, the Amplified, the Amplified Bible reads it like this. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our guilt and iniquities, the chastisement needful to obtain peace and well-being for us was upon him. And with the stripes that wounded him, we are healed and made whole. Often when we hear prayers offered up in this manner, I or we plead the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This, this is an understanding that the blood of Jesus have impact on those who trust in him spiritually as well as their physical well-being. And I believe we as Christians, we have to embrace that because when we study through this prophetic insight by the prophet Isaiah, which I believe without a shadow of a doubt, he's able to look into the future at the coming Messiah. And I believe there are lessons that you and I can gain from Jesus in his life, in his ministry, whereby we can see that this blood covenant that Jesus ushered in is a blood covenant that does not only provide God's power to minister to our spiritual needs, but also to our physical needs. And in the scriptures that I just read in Isaiah 53, verse 1 through 6, we see here that Christ came as a suffering Savior. That was what confused a lot of the Jews in the manner in which Christ came, in the manner in which this Messiah, this great deliverer came. He did not come in a manner in which they were looking for a king to come. But God, in all of his wisdom, he knew that Jesus had to come in such a way that suffering would be the weapon that he would overcome the devil in all of his works. And so the first lesson you and I can gain from this prophetic insight is simply this. 
Christ came as a suffering Savior. As the prophet as Isaiah describes how and why Christ came, he does not avoid revealing how he would be treated and rejected by those into whom he came to suffer and die for. Now, these individuals that Jesus suffered under, they represent the whole of humanity because it's the whole of humanity that have went astray as sheep, has turned from the bishop of the overseer of the guardian of their soul. So it is a picture of a suffering savior. We see that in verse number five. We see that in verse eight B for the Bible say, and you will declare his generation for he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. Verse 5 says that he was wounded for our transgression and he was bruised for our iniquity. What's that? That's a suffering Savior. And also in verse 10, it said, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied for his knowledge, my righteous, by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. Now get this, for he shall bear their iniquities. So verse 5, verse 8b, and verse 10 through 11 spells out, that this suffering was for transgression. What's transgression? Rebellion against God. We as, as individuals born into this earth, we have a fallen nature. This nature is set in autopilot to rebel against God. He uses the word iniquities. That is the sins of our sinful nature and of our deliberate choices. You see, we make choices. In Deuteronomy 30, 19, the word of the Lord say, I put before you death and life, blessings and curses, so therefore choose life that you and your children, what? We are decision makers. We have a will. And we, even after being born again, we still make choices that are not always in agreement with the word of God, the will of God, and it is a form of iniquities, a deliberate choice of sin. And then he goes on and he talks about not only uh, the transgressions and iniquities, but he talks about peace with God. We see that in verse 5b. This peace with God is only brought through the sufferings of Jesus, and he mentions spiritual and physical well-being. It's what we call healing. Now, when we remember the blood covenant, these things which Jesus did should inspire our prayers and confidence and God's ability of faith in God's ability. Those who want to separate God's ability to save from God's ability to heal, that is meet physical needs as well as spiritual needs in our life, they leave no source of confidence in one's prayers. If God is not a God who can and will heal physical conditions why then are we encouraged to pray to him concerning physical as well as spiritual matters in our life? That is, that is what uh, causes me to uh, 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 become uh, conflicted with that mindset that God is not a healer, that healing is not the children's bread. That because the Holy Spirit has come, we no longer need the healings and the miracles. Well, the last time I read, the Bible said God does not change. 
He is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. He's an unchanging God. God is God. And when we teach a theology or a doctrine that, that, that we can come to God for spiritual matters, oh, but when it comes to physical matters, we're just going to have to trust medicine and man, and we're going to have to trust uh, the knowledge that God has given man. No, no, no. Then we have to put our confidence in man. The Bible encourages us to put our confidence in the Lord. Here again. When there are conditions, even in the physical part of our lives, there's the first response of what? Prayer. Even people who claim that God is not a healer, they don't realize what they're saying. Well, we need to pray. We need to trust God. Well, if we're going to pray and we're going to trust God, how are we going to pray and how are we going to trust God if we believe that healing is no longer the children's bread? It doesn't agree with Scripture. God is a God that meets spiritual and physical needs in the life of those who come to him. Listen to some scriptures that just general scriptures that teaches us that God is a holistic God. He comes to minister to the whole of our lives. In Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And do not rely on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct in all of your ways what? Acknowledge him. Acknowledge who he is. Acknowledge what he has done. And acknowledge what he has said. In what? In all of our ways. Not just our spiritual matters of life, but all matters of our life. And then we read in the scriptures where it says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, be anxious or don't worry about nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God in the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. Here again, in everything, pray. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. But bring everything to God in prayer, spiritual matters, physical matters, financial matters, relational matters. The whole of our life comes under the scope of God's divine grace and power. And then in James chapter 5, verse 13, says, are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. If any of you have, are, are happy, you should sing praises. And then he goes down in verse 14. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord Jesus. And verse 15 said, the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. So here again, these are just general scriptures that confirms that God, Jesus Christ, in this blood covenant, he has not only given us a covenant to meet our spiritual needs, but meet our physical needs as well. Now, if praying and trusting God for physical healing by way of the blood covenant of Jesus, why would the New Testament identify a case of physical healing that Jesus carried out and then quote Isaiah 55 and 5 as a reference to what Jesus had just done. Well, take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew uh, chapter 8. Let's look at Matthew chapter 8. We have to let the word of God speak because we can give all things in our human intellect, even in what we call spiritual knowledge, and we can begin to reason out or rationalize, rationalize out what, why we shouldn't trust God. But in all of our ways, we need to acknowledge him. And physical issues and physical conditions and health issues is a way that we need to acknowledge God. And if I don't believe God is a God that has the ability to be able to minister to physical matters of my life, why should I even go to him in prayer? I'm not going to go to him and ask God to make me sicker. I'm not going to ask God to make my condition worse. I'm going to ask God to heal me. I'm going to ask God to direct my step and show me the way that I should go in order to get this matter addressed in my life. And so we see then in Matthew 8, I hope you're there by now. 
Look at verse number 14. The Bible says, now when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her hand and the fever left her and she arose and served them. Hallelujah. That's the touch of Jesus. And then in verse 16, when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon possessed and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick. Now, when he prayed for Peter's mother, uh, mother-in-law, it says nothing about a demon. Says she had a fever, a physical issue going on. And he simply touched her, prayed, and she was ill. However, we see that there are certain healings that has a spiritual issue behind them. And here these people are unclean, uh, 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 they are dealing with spirits of infirmities. Issues whereby there's a demonic force behind it. And Jesus addressed that issue too. So we learned that all conditions don't have to have a demon involved. But there are conditions where there is a demonic force that has to be dealt with. And that's where spiritual discernment comes in operation. God will reveal to you concerning the matter and how you need to address it in prayer. So in verse 16, when the evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon possessed and he cast out the spirits. Now notice, he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and he bore our sicknesses. Now notice that Jesus, the writer, quotes Isaiah 53 and 5 when it came to Jesus performing physical healings. So that lets me know that when the prophet speaks in Isaiah 53 and 5, he's not only talking about spiritual conditions, but he's also talking about physical conditions. I submit to you that because of what Jesus did as a suffering Savior, we who are in covenant with God through faith in Jesus, the Messiah, are to place our confidence in Christ's suffering, not only to address our spiritual condition and needs, but also our physical condition and needs in life. And from here, we allow God's sovereign grace to be the overruling factor as relative to the final outcome and not a lack of faith in God's power or God's ability. In 2 Corinthians, this is confirmed by the Apostle Paul in his prayer for God to heal him. This apostle who was loved by God, called by God, anointed by God, he prayed for physical healing. Now notice what the scripture says, says 2 Corinthians 12 and 7, it begins like this. Paul said, and because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, to keep me from exalting myself. So Paul is basically saying God allowed the enemy to have access in this way into my life. And as a result of this access that the enemy was given, just like remember, did Satan ask for permission to what? To torment Job. For, for, for whatever sovereign reason God, he allowed that to happen. And Paul is basically saying God allowed the enemy, Satan, to buffet me. But notice what happened in verse 8. Concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart. You know what Paul said? I prayed three times about this matter. And I asked the Lord to deliver me. That's what he said. He said, I prayed that the Lord would take this thing away from me. And then he realized this is how God answered his prayer. See, Paul was willing to submit to God's sovereign response. He didn't get mad at God because God didn't answer the prayer in the manner that he was uh, requesting it. He had too much faith to know that God was good. That regardless whether God heals him or not, that God, his time was in the Lord's hand and he was going to exercise his faith to persevere and do the will of God. And so he said, God responded, sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmity that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Paul said, what was the answer? God's grace. God didn't answer him for physical healing in the manner which Paul was looking for him to do it. 
But Paul recognized that God did answer him and said simply, my grace is sufficient for you. And so we have to recognize that ultimately it is God's final decision and we just trust him that he knows much more than we know. Well, another example is Philippians chapter 2 and verse 25. Listen to this servant of the Lord, one who's faithful, loyal to God, but yet look what happens in his life. Paul said here in Philippians 2, 25, yet I consider it necessary to send to you Ephoratius, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. Since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. He, in other words, he was sick. Listen, Christians get sick. And it isn't because they're out of the will of God. It isn't because they've done something and people go back and say, oh, honey, look here. Oh, look what they're reaping and all. No, no. It's part of the human experience. It's part of being in the natural world. So here this person loved God, serving God, faithful in ministry. All of a sudden he's sick. In verse 27, for indeed he was sick, Paul confirming it. He was sick and almost to the point of death, but God had mercy on him and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in high esteem because for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. Notice for the work of Christ, he came close to death. He was that committed to the things of God. That whatever it was, the Bible doesn't spell it out, but we know the scripture says, for the work of Christ, for carrying out the will of God, he became ill. So I want us to see the balance because this is how the water get muddy and people go to the extreme when people do weird stuff when it comes to healing. You know, churches stand up and when nobody don't get healed, they want to just, you know, start blaming, blaming oh, the person lacked faith and all this. Are they teaching a doctrine? That make people feel that if anybody gets sick in the church, they got to do what? Try to keep it from the church because they think, oh, this is some, oh, I let the devil. No, listen, listen. Sickness is part of the human experience. We still have a suit, a body that's made out of clay. These bodies are not the glorified bodies. And therefore, the Bible teaches us things that we need to do even in the natural that we can maintain our health when it comes to proper eating, when it comes to exercise, when it comes to making sure we're managing stress in our lives. You can't, you can't speak faith to avoid doing any of these things. That's foolishness. You've got to know there's, there are natural laws that we have to respect, natural things that we have to respect in the natural world. And even when you respect all those natural rules, you can still end up getting a report of a sickness. And it does not mean that God does not love you. I want to bring balance with that because that is the, that, that is the teaching that, as I call, muddy the water. When we have that, that, you know, that foolish doctrine out there. Just like the doctrine that tells everybody God wants you to be materialistically rich in this world. You know, that's, 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 that's erroneous teaching. I want to encourage you, God will give you what you need in order to fulfill your purpose in the earth. He will give you what you can manage and honor him with. He will give you what he know he can entrust you with, that you may honor him with. And there are people who do not honor the word of the Lord, who do not honor tithes and offerings and giving into God's kingdom, but yet they go around with a prosperity message of where God's getting ready to take them, of them being an entrepreneur, of them being rich. You see how the enemy comes in and uses the flesh to magnify foolishness? Well, he does the same thing when it comes to people who are anti, uh, who have a God who they don't believe want to be involved in every area of our life. God doesn't want to be involved in our spiritual matters of life, and God want to be a part of our physical uh, matters of life. And in everything, we need to do prayer, bring the matter to God. Just like we cannot conclude that all will be saved, even though Jesus died in order for people to be saved, we need to also know that all may not be healed in a 
natural way in which we understand healing. All may not be healed in a manner in which we request it. Just like Paul requested his healing in a certain way, yet God did not manifest it in that way. And that's where we got to be humble enough to know that we're going to trust God and believe that God is good. Whether or not we get the healing in the way we are looking for it, we know that God is faithful and God is true and we're going to trust him. Well, let's move on. Christ came not only as a suffering savior, but Christ also came as a surrendered savior. In verse seven, the prophet said he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In verse nine, it says, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. In verse 79, the prophet reveals that Christ not only suffered the just for the unjust, but he surrendered his will to the will of the Father. And when the world led him through their judicial process that day with lies and deception and their crooked system of judgment, he submitted himself not to the will of man, but to the will of the Father. His suffering was a result of his surrendering to the will of the Father and trusting the plan of the Father based on his words. This kind of surrendering to the will of the Father or the word of God is what causes believers to remain in fellowship with God despite the sufferings of this present world. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 2 when Jesus is used by the apostle Peter as an example for us all relative to suffering. In verse 21, he says, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering. Just as Christ suffered for you, he is your example, and you must follow in his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges right. He kept doing what? He kept entrusting himself to the will of the Father. He knew that despite his suffering, despite how they, they put stripes on his back and beat him and all of those things, he knew that he was submitted to the will of the Father. And then in verse 24 and 25, in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to the shepherd or guardian of your soul. We have turned what? To the overseer of our soul. The one who, the one who oversees the whole of our life. The last thing I see in this prophetic insight that Isaiah provides is that not only Christ came as a suffering Savior and as a surrendered Savior, but Christ came as a successful Savior. Let me say that again. He came as a successful Savior. Look at verse 10b. The Bible says, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. In the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Verse 11, 8, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many. Look at verse 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for transgression, this is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Cannot be no one else but Jesus Christ because only Jesus have done this for us. So the blood covenant that Jesus died to provide the church, the redeemed ones, is a covenant that is active, not as it was then, as it was then, so it is now. This blood covenant never loses power. What Jesus did and who Jesus is then is who he is now and what he will do now. But we have to know this based on the blood covenant. 
And what so often we call a tragedy in our limited sphere of this world becomes a triumphant moment when God is working behind the scene and causing a bad experience to become a glorious event. And that's what Calvary did. It was a bad experience that became a glorious event. Jesus suffering and surrendering, even in that suffering, produced kingdom success. What does this success look like from a blood covenant standpoint? First of all, there's kingdom offspring. We see that in verse 10 B. God has now provided a way that we are the offspring of God. We are the children of God. And here we live and move and have our being. We belong to God. Because of what Christ did with this blood covenant, we are God's offspring. Not only that, but there's kingdom fulfillment. In verse 11a, the Bible says, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. This is the success that the, the suffering Savior brought into the earth. And not only that, in verse 12, there are kingdom rewards. Oh my God, hallelujah. The Bible say that Jesus Christ, he bore the sin of many and he made intercession for transgressors. When Jesus died on that cross, he was interceding for transgressors, for those who were in, who were in rebellion against God. The Bible say in Romans 5 eight, God demonstrated his love for us even while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us, hallelujah. And so when we're in this blood covenant, we are not just looking at a savior who came to provide spiritual healing, but Jesus came to provide physical healing in all of your ways, acknowledge him. And that's why when we go to God, we go to God, recognize we're in a blood covenant and it's the children's bread. It is our rights and benefits to know that in God's kingdom, there is healing for the nation. Hallelujah. God provides healing. Don't ever buy into the fact that, oh, the only healing we can have is what man and medicine can give us. Thank God for giving man that ability. But our trust is not in man. Our trust is not in medicine. Our trust is in the living God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who knew no sin and became sin, that you and I may be made the righteousness of God. And when the devil thought driving him through those courts of that judicial system of that world was going to stop. Jesus, all of those stripes and that beating and that blood just dried coming out of his body, all of those scars, all of that humiliation. He didn't realize he was setting Jesus up so blood could be released. And you and I can say today that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes and with his stripes, we are healed. And when we pray, we trust God that Jesus is our healer. The psalmist said that he sent his word and healed them. Hallelujah. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. You and I get to now with the full assurance of faith. We know what it means to plead the blood of Jesus through prayer concerning everything and every situation in life because Christ's blood have allowed us to know that in his suffering, in his surrendering, and in his success of victory over the cross and over the grave that the Lord Jesus Christ have given us a right to the tree of life. Galatians 3.13 says that Christ was hung on a tree in order that the blessings of Abraham may come upon us. It's not going to come because of the law. It's going to come because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when you plead the blood in prayer, you got a revelation. There's power in that blood for not only meeting my spiritual need, but in my body, I believe God that the blood brings healing. He carried my sickness and sorrows. He bore them on the cross so I can stand up today and declare that by his stripes, I am healed. Why am I going to pray? Why am I going to go to God concerning conditions in my life if I don't believe that God has the power and the compassion to meet my need and then trust him for the final outcome as Paul did? When he prayed and God decided to answer it, not as Paul requested, but in a manner that assured Paul that my grace is sufficient for the whole of your life. Hallelujah. 
Well, I have two faith action questions. The first one goes like this. Do you believe that Jesus, your Savior, is also Jesus, your healer? If so, how does this shape and strengthen your faith in his power or uh, ability? Some are adamant that Jesus is my Savior. Well, we need to be adamant that Jesus is my healer as well, based on Isaiah 53. The other question is, when God's response is not your perfect request, how will you draw closer to him and not doubt his goodness? There are people that have gotten mad at God due to a lack of knowledge when they prayed for healing for themselves or somebody else, and it didn't manifest the way that they thought it should have. Remember, he's the power and we're the clay. So we just trust him. And that regardless of whatever or however he responds, we're going to stay in faith. We're going to keep worshiping him and declaring that he is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endure to all generation. We're going to keep giving him the glory do his name. Because whether or not God manifests healing in the way I request it or not, He's still my God. He's still my king. He's still my deliverer. He's still my supplier. He's still my savior. He is still my healer. And that's the attitude of faith we should have in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to stop right here. I know you've been richly blessed by the word of God because the word of God is life and health to all our flesh. Faith come by here and hear by the word and your faith should be encouraged now. You keep pleading the blood of Jesus. You keep knowing that that blood has power. That is a blood covenant we are in. And you plead that blood in your prayer life. Hallelujah. We'll have a few announcements. This coming Sunday is our Resurrection Sunday. We want to encourage you to come out and take part with us in our uh, uh, in-person gathering at 10 a.m. Our drama ministry is going to be communicating a, 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 a word of wisdom to, uh, based on God's kingdom principles. Uh, through creative arts. So we want to encourage you to come and be a part of that. And we're going to also provide a special children's ministry service for that particular Sunday. So we encourage you to bring those children out uh, so they can receive ministry as well. Successful singles ministry. Uh, you all have a set time, May the 28th. Uh, there's someone from your team that's communicating with you or going to be reaching out to you. Make sure that you check those means of communication you all have in place so you can get the knowledge you need for this uh, time that you're going to go, all going to go and have an enriching and encouraging moment together. And remember that this Sunday is our Warfare Seed Sunday, Mission Sunday for our church, where we sow beyond tithes and we give also into mission that the ministry of Word of Life would not only minister to needs within our walls, but they would also minister to needs outside of our walls. Thank you for being committed to that. Some of you are going to get uh, leave this particular uh, uh, time right now with the Word, and I pray in Jesus' name that God will bless your seed that is sown and cause that seed to multiply. And every time you go out there and, and you click on that website or you use text to give or whatever avenue you use to give into God's work, I pray the anointing of God's power and grace to be upon your finances that God will continue to replenish and supply you with all that you need in abundance so that you can minister not only to the needs of your life and your family but you can also minister to the needs of others I believe that's the anointing and season that God has the church in now that you know there are things going on in this world and we understand that but our hope and our faith is not in the condition of our world but it is in the word of the living God and he said in his word that I will supply all of your needs of according to my riches and glory through Christ Jesus. That supply of need is for those who are givers into God's work and those who thank him for his supply in their life. Well, God bless you and have a wonderful day in the wonderful name of our resurrected Jesus Christ. Hallelujah.